Hello and welcome to Merlin's Manor. Today I'm going to be giving my thoughts on Slay the Spire the board game, which is based on the video game of the same name. Slay the Spire is published by Contention Games and has both a standard and a deluxe version. I have the deluxe version which has several component upgrades. Before we get into my thoughts on the game, I'm going to give a brief gameplay overview. So Slay the Spire is a deck building game where you're going to start out with a very basic deck which is similar for all of the characters but which have a couple cards that are unique to each character. And then you'll be gaining better cards as you ascend the spire. There will also be opportunities to cull the weaker cards from the deck. Now the primary way that you'll get new cards is after each battle where you'll be given three options and you may choose one to add to your deck. The cards you'll be adding will come from a reward deck that is specific to your character. Bosses and some events will even give you special rare cards from the rare rewards deck specific to your character. There are four characters to choose from, each with a different starting relic and unique deck of cards. The Ironclad has the ability to heal at the end of combat and has cards that focus around strengthening and vulnerability. The Silent starts with two extra cards in her starting hand and focuses around adding poison, getting shivs, and drawing and discarding cards. The Defect focuses around orbs which have innate abilities and can be invoked for more powerful effects. And the Watcher changes stances to get more energy or deal more damage and can gain miracles which give energy and has the ability to scry which means looking at the upcoming cards and discarding any number of them and sometimes along with that drawing a card while doing it. In Slay the Spire you will be attempting to build a deck of cards that synergize well and gain relics with powerful abilities in order to become more powerful as you face harder battles to in the end be able to defeat the various bosses. You start out with a special Niao's Blessing from a random card draw which always gives you starting gold and a starting card reward and then gives a few options to choose from to give you a jump start into powering up. As you ascend the spire, you'll have standard enemy encounters, elite encounters, events, shops to spend gold to acquire or coal cards, and acquire potions or relics. And finally, you'll have opportunities to either heal or upgrade cards at the campfires. You upgrade cards by taking the card out of the sleeve, like so, and flipping it over, and it becomes a more powerful card. As alluded to earlier, these battles will start out easy and get harder and harder as you ascend, but you should be leveling up as well through card draws and relics. In the battles, you'll be spending energy to play cards each round to primarily do damage to enemies, build up block, or power up in various ways. And then the enemies will take a turn to attack, defend, or power up based on what is on their card. Some enemies perform the same action each time, some have a progression of actions, and some perform a random action based on a die roll. As you fight battles, you have to be careful not to take too much damage because your health does not reset after each battle, though it does reset after each boss fight before proceeding to the next act. Each battle will give you rewards, and the elite monsters, while harder to fight, also give stronger rewards. The game is played over three acts, and you can save between acts and come back later if you need to, with each act ending in a boss fight which will really test how well you built out your deck. In addition to cards and relics, you can also collect potions along the way that will help you in a pinch. After each game, you'll be able to progress towards unlocking better card rewards and ultimately unlocking Act 4, which includes a special boss fight which must be unlocked during the game by collecting gems by doing three tasks as you ascend, fighting a special elite, foregoing the gaining of a relic, and foregoing utilizing the campfire area. And that's how the game is played. Now let's get into the game review, starting with art and components. The art and components are great. The artwork has a zany feel to it, which is the same as the video game. You'll be facing off against very unique looking monsters and there's quite a bit of variation. The cards you play also have very nice artwork with lots of unique imagery on them. I really like the unique art in this game. As far as the components go, even in the standard game, you have high quality components between the boards and the colored miniatures. The player boards are dual layered, 
with track to place your cubes on and the HB track has individual spaces so the cube will not easily get bumped out of the space with the block and energy tracks having one long indented area which allow you to slide the cubes more which is more practical for those tracks. Overall very well designed. The card quality is not too important because all of the cards that you're going to be shuffling need to be sleeved. The sleeves so far have held up for me. I use the mash shuffling method like this and they've held up through that. I, I have not had any issues so far with the sleeves separating, but I have heard that others have had issues, and this, uh, this style of art sleeve does tend to have issues with separating pretty quickly, so I'm not sure how long they will hold up over time. I'm hoping that it, these issues have been primarily caused by riffle shuffling, and that with mass shuffling, the sleeves might hold up longer. Now you also have a bunch of standard plastic cubes for tracking various things as well as other standard standard cardboard pieces. Uh, one contention that I have is that the three and five poison tokens are the same where you just kind of have to flip them to get to the other side. I would have preferred that they have separate tokens. That's perhaps a small nitpick there. Now getting into the upgraded components, I find them well worth the extra cost. The deluxe edition comes with these nice metal coins that fit the theme very well. They're very thematic, and I always enjoy metal coins over cardboard any day. The coins also come in a very nice cloth bag, but it's really unnecessary because you'll only be storing them in that bag and you'll be taking them out at the start of each game. The neoprene mats are great. They provide a helpful way to organize everything with an area to place your player board, an area for the power cards, areas for your draw deck, discard pile, and exhausted cards. Plus, each mat has artwork of your character that's a nice touch there as well. There's also a neoprene mat for all of the various decks in the deluxe version that has icons for each deck to help organize setting up the various decks. Now, all versions come with a nice organization system as well, with the deluxe edition having a bigger box with a storage area for the play mats included. This organization system makes setup fairly quick despite the large amount of things to set up each game. Overall, the art and components gets a huge thumbs up from me, especially when it comes to the deluxe version of the game. And while the deluxe components certainly are not necessary for the game, I do personally find them to be a worthwhile investment. Now let's talk about ease of play. This game is not too easy to learn if this is your first experience with Slay the Spire. If you're coming from being a player of the video game, it will be fairly easy to learn, though there are several differences in the way things work that you'll need to be careful to learn. Some of these big differences that I could see being missed are how weakness, poison, and vulnerability work. Now, there are quite a few things that are also simplified in the board game to make it easier to implement when you do not have the system being run by a video game engine. Now, if this is your first experience with Slay the Spire, you're going to have to learn quite a few mechanisms for the battles, such as strengthen, weakness, vulnerability, area of effect, ethereal, and exhaust being those main ones, as well as character-specific abilities, such as scry, poison, orbs, retain, and the stance mechanism. So there's quite a bit that you're going to have to learn. Thankfully, there is a helpful abilities and keywords section on the back of the rulebook, and the flow of battle is fairly easy itself. You take turns using energy to pay for cards and go into the enemy's turns, which are fairly easy to run as well once you learn the meaning of those various abilities. Any block you had from the previous turn goes away at the start of your turn, and any block enemies had from a previous turn goes away at the start of their turn. All fairly intuitive stuff. Gaining of rewards is also easy to understand once you learn that the card rewards are reveal three, pick one. The biggest difficulty is going to be in learning all the various key words. I also personally found the way weakness and vulnerability apply when it comes to multi-attacks to be a little less than intuitive, but once you realize that they apply to the entire attack action before losing the token, then you've got it. Overall, I would put ease of play somewhere in the middle. Not super easy, but not too hard either. As far as the characters go, the Ironclad will be the easiest entry into the game, followed by the Silent and the Defect, with the Watcher being the most complex of the characters to learn, as well as the hardest to master being the Watcher. 
Now let's get into the gameplay review itself. If you enjoy deck building, fighting games, then you will probably enjoy this game. There are plenty of unique abilities represented in the cards you can add to your deck, which will lead to different builds with each playthrough. Some cards are very common, and so you will likely see each game with others being uncommon, having fewer versions. And then of course there are the rare cards that you'll only get with rare rewards or finding a golden ticket in your basic rewards deck. I really like that each character has their own unique reward cards and the mechanism for adding cards where you get to look at three cards and choose one, which gives you some degree of control within that randomness. Also, you must be careful about adding too many different cards to your deck or even too many of the same card. Trying to make a deck that is well balanced and synergizes well. And sometimes you have to resist adding a card that in another build would be good, but in your current build actually weakens your deck by clogging it up and making it harder to get to the cards that you really need. I really like how the power cards give you an interesting decision between helping you overall for the battle while perhaps making your current round in that battle a little bit weaker. And in short battles, you may want to avoid using power cards at all and go for stronger early rounds where as in the longer battles, you really want to focus on getting those power cards out as early as possible, even if it means taking a bit of a hit of not doing much else that round. I also really like the balance involved in defending versus attacking, and that you have to be careful about taking too much damage in battles, because you do not heal except by special abilities and campfires and some events. At campfires, you also have the interesting decision between healing three health points versus upgrading cards, as healing can be helpful in the short term, but upgrades are going to improve your overall game. And the game really encourages you to push things to the limit to best level up while not quite dying. After all, if you beat a boss with six health points left, but at the cost of not upgrading any of your cards, then you'll not be as well prepared for the future where you barely beat the boss because you went into the boss fight with less health points, but you focused on upgrading those cards. There's also the push and pull between fighting elites for the powerful rewards versus skipping them to not risk taking too much of a hit on your health. That will be, be difficult to recover before the boss, or potentially even kill you before reaching the boss. If you don't take some risks in the early to mid game, then you might just find yourself not powered up enough for the bosses, but if you take too many risks, you may also lose. Figuring out how to strike a good balance adds an interesting layer to this game. I also really like the feeling of leveling up and getting stronger throughout the game. The primary way you get more powerful outside of gaining cards is through gaining relics that are going to often give you ongoing abilities that are either one-time use per combat or relate to triggers or specific die rolls. A little side note, I like how the die roll at the beginning of the round works for both relics and enemy actions. It simplifies things. There's also an interesting balance between adding cards to your deck, foregoing the addition of adding cards, and culling cards, which you can do once per store for three coins. And then some events let you remove or transform a card by removing that card and adding a random card reward. I also really love how each character plays very differently with their unique decks and the unique mechanisms that go along with each deck. I really love the orbs of the defect which give some innate damage or innate block each round and the interesting ways you can use that to your advantage. Maybe get a bunch of frost orbs out for your defense and then focus on fighting with your cards. Or get a bunch of lightning out to do a bunch of, a t of damage while you use a bunch of block with your cards while your lightning chips away at the enemy's health. Then there is the silent who adds poison which slowly eats away at the health of enemies or uses shivs to do extra damage which can combine with card abilities that combo well with the ac extra attacks found with shivs or even abilities that require discarding cards. Then there is the Watcher who changes stances, but you want to be careful about getting caught in Wrath without the block to cover for the extra one damage you'll take if you're still in Wrath at the end of your turn. And the satisfaction that comes with having extra energy from exiting Calm, or from having some miracle tokens that you have saved up for that big turn. And finally, if you just want to be able to tank and do some big hits, you can go with the Ironclad. 
Each character provides a different gameplay feel, and if you don't particularly care for one playstyle, then you can use a character's playstyle that fits for you. Overall, I just really, really like the gameplay of this game. The only potential downside I can see is that you can get unlucky with the way your cards come up, or with an enemy that your build does not work well for, and you lose, and then there's a lot of setup and build up to now lose and have to start over. Granted, a big part of that often boils down to poor choices that probably that you probably made along the way, but to have so much set up and tear down and not being able to as easily just jump into another run with how long the game takes to play. Especially if you're used to the video game where you can just jump in and play another run where full runs probably take you under an hour. The board game, however, runs about an hour per act, so if you lose, most anticlimactically, you're probably not just setting up for another run at that point. I wanted to briefly talk about how this game compares to the video game. At some point I want to do a full video going over the major differences between the two, but I'll briefly make some comparisons right now. My first experience with Slay the Spire was actually the board game when I played it at Dice Tower East this year. With the board game being not in stock yet for those who did not back the Kickstarter, I took advantage of a sale on the video game on Steam while I waited for the board game to be in stock. I have since logged over 150 hours on the video game. Now the biggest advantage for the video game, which I have alluded to already, is the ability to play quicker and without the setup. It is also nice to witness the battles take place with the graphics. However, the tactile nature of the board game adds its own extra dimension. The video game is going to simplify things a bit by doing all of the calculations for you, but the board game does help you be a little more aware of what the enemies are doing. One big difference between the two is that everything is scaled back to make calculations easier for the board game. This scaling back also to a degree makes things tighter. In the video game, giving up damage to make hits or to set up powers is more forgiving than in the board game. While you still have to sometimes be willing to take a hit to give a hit or to set up, you do have to be more careful about that overall in the board game version. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, a run in the video game is much less of an investment of your time than in the board game, and you can much more easily just reset and go in the video game. There are also several mechanical changes that were made that make things that would be harder to keep up with in the video game more easy to follow, but with also, which also change up how you will do things. The biggest pro to the board game is that it can be played with up to four players, whereas the video game is only solo. And the added cooperation adds an element to the game. While often you'll be simply focusing on your own row, there are additional synergies to be had when playing cooperatively with other players. Some abilities allow you to share defense with others. Some players may have an area of effect attack that are better utilized on another row. Sometimes it can be tactically sound to help one player take out their row and then everyone focuses on the other rows after that. Sometimes one player will add vulnerable for another player's big attack and so on. For the cooperative nature alone, I feel like I can highly recommend getting this game in addition to having the video game. I also feel like even solo, the board game adds some different puzzles to solve that can be satisfying even for those who play the video game that you might find worthwhile. But you do have to consider if the extra time investment is worth it, plus the price tag is quite a bit higher for the board game than for the video game. But then again, there is that tactile experience that may add value to you. I'm not sure if I would get this game just for the solo experience, with the video game being out there just because of the ease of jumping on the laptop and playing, versus setting up a rather large and time-consuming game on the table, plus that additional cost. Though I will still play it solo when I have the time to do so. But for the combination of being able to play this game solo and cooperatively with others, I feel I can highly recommend it. Now let's talk about replayability. For a game with a limited amount of bosses, only three for each act, and a limited amount of elite enemies, again three per act, I find this game to have quite a bit of replayability. Just like in the video game, there's a ton of different ways the game is going to play out based on what comes up. There are going to be different builds that you're going to be pushed into depending on which cards come up and when, the, and when those cards come up. And even beyond the luck of the draw, early game guiding you into different builds, you can exercise a certain amount of agency in choosing different builds just to change things up and try a different strategy. 
There are four characters who play very differently from one another. And then within each of those characters, there's a wide variety of cards that are going to change each game. Beyond that, there are about a dozen different enemies for each act, plus various summons that have slight variations among the same type of summons even. The board itself is a mixture of static spots that will be the same every time and randomized spots that will change the path each game. Plus, Act 1 has two options for the original static board setup by flipping the board over. You also have the variety from the relics and potions that you will receive, with the relics often being a major factor in how you'll change your strategy as you go. In short, this game has a ton of replay value to it. Now let's talk briefly about the theme. This game is a roguelike game that simulates going through a dungeon, battling monsters and bosses. This game is packed full of theme. Each character has their own deck of cards which builds up abilities that fit thematically with that character. There is a feeling of progression leveling up from the cards and the relics that you pick up. As you beat a monster, you get stronger by adding a card, which is a, like experience that you're getting from that battle. Plus, you find gold and or potions that will be helpful. The various enemies have attacks that vary depending on the type of enemy that helps build the theme as well. This game is not a dungeon crawler, but definitely does the boss battler theme well within the dungeon genre. Now let's get into my final thoughts. I'm giving this game a 9.5 out of 10. I originally gave it a 9 in my first impressions video, but my appreciation for this game has only grown since then, and I've realized the vast replayability that comes from a combination of the four characters and the many ways you can build your deck and how each game will be influenced by what comes up. I love the deck building in this game and how you get to choose from three cards after each battle and how this game actually encourages you to think carefully about the cards you're adding because if you add too many cards, it can actually be detrimental. You have to actually consider what value a card will add to your current build rather than just taking every card that is good. A card that is great in another build may actually just clog your deck in your current build. I also like how the game forces you to live on the edge, choosing between what is going to make you stronger overall versus healing or avoiding tough battles that may hurt you. The art and components are great and help pull you into the theme of this game. As someone who has now played both the video game and the board game, I can see the board game adding value if you want to play cooperatively or if you'd like to have a more tactile experience with a slightly different strategic puzzle to solve, even for the solo game. Although I do personally find the video game quicker and easier to play, and so more often I find myself playing the video game solo over playing the board game solo. Plus, the video game is much cheaper, so that is a consideration as well for those solely looking to play this game solo. If you have logged many hours on the video game and would like a slightly different experience, you could definitely find value in getting the board game. And of course, if you want an experience outside of, outside of screen time, then this might be the option for you when it comes to playing Slay the Spire as well. Personally, given the fact that this game exists in a quicker and easier to get into experience with the video game, I would probably not get this personally just as a solo game, but since it provides a way to play the game cooperatively, which adds an extra layer of strategy, I find it worthwhile to get both for cooperative and solo play. And I could see others who would prefer to play a board game over a video game being satisfied with this even for purely solo play. Overall, I highly recommend this game if you enjoy cooperative deck building games and boss battle games and don't mind a game that's going to take a decent time investment as each act takes about an hour to maybe even an hour and a half to play and the game plays over three acts. But you can save your game between acts and play the game over three sessions if you would like. I hope you have found this video helpful in determining if this is a game for you. I enjoy it very much personally. I encourage you to check out my how to play video here or this full playthrough with the silent here if you'd like to get more of a feel for how this game plays. I hope you have a great week and keep on gaming.